a park ranger stands forward facing in uniform of a tan flat hat, gray shirt, and green trousers. The ranger stands in a parking lot. Behind the ranger is a row of trees and a row of American flags. Behind the trees and flags is a paved road and houses, and rising in the distance is White Oak Mountain. Hello, this is Ranger Lee White coming to you all from the parking lot of the Welcome Hill Baptist Church just northeast of Ringgold, all in part of the Ringgold Gap battlefield. Though the Battle of Ringgold is largely forgotten by many in the shadow of the Union victories at Chattanooga, it had a huge impact on the men who fought here, especially for the men of Colonel William Crichton's brigade of John White Gary's division. As they had arrived in Ringgold with the roar of battle from the east and southeast of town, Creighton received orders from Gary to deploy his brigade along the railroad tracks just north and east of town, facing a ravine running up the side of White Oak Mountain. They were to immediately advance and take the ridge to their front, thus turning the flank of the Confederate forces that were stubbornly defending the gap to the south. Creighton pictured here in Union officer's uniform, was new to command of the brigade and having replaced Colonel Charles Candy, who was injured in the attack on Lookout Mountain a few days earlier. Creighton's regiment, now under the command of his close friend, Lieutenant Colonel Orrin J. Crane, pictured here in Union officer's uniform with heavy mustache. As the men formed up, Colonel Creighton rode down to his old regiment and dismounted to speak to them. Mounting a nearby rock, he shouted encouragement to his men that they, that they were ordered to take the heights. And I expect to see you roosters walk right over them. He then gave the regiment's distinctive battle cry, crowing like a rooster, flapping his arms, which was answered in turn by his men. Early in the war, they had become known as the Rooster Regiment. They adopted the, the crow as their battle cry and wore a distinctive roots, rooster pin upon their uniforms. Rooster pin pictured here on a soldier. They were a veteran outfit who had seen heavy fighting at Cedar Mountain, Virginia, Antietam, Maryland, Chancellorsville, Virginia, and Gettysburg, among many others. As the bugle sounded the advance for the brigade, amid the cheers could distinctly be heard the crow of the roosters. As they advanced over the tracks, over the open space, over the hill we're on right now, they advanced toward a ravine that ran up the side of White Oak Mountain. On the eastern side of the ridge, Confederate infantry moved up to extend their line, keeping just east of the ridge to hide their new position, going unobserved by Creighton's attacking men. As Creighton's men neared the top, the Confederates made their appearance, forming above the back of the ravine and opening fire. Creighton's men now found themselves in a crossfire as they slowly tried to keep advancing up Comrades fell all around them. Captain Ernst Krieger, pictured here, clean shaven except for a short goatee in Union officer's uniform. Commander of the 7th Ohio's All-German Company K, later remembered, the 7th ascended a ravine which enabled the enemy to direct an effective fire on us from the front and both flanks, making us lose severely all along the line. The steepness of the ascent necessarily made our progress very slow, but the regiment persevered in its advance, not stopping to return fire. The regiment nearly gained the crest of the hill within a few yards of the rebels when the fire became too heavy and effective to, for flesh and blood to withstand. Here, Lieutenant Colonel Orrin J. Crane fell, one of the bravest and best of officers, and as a mere handful only remained, and as there was no hope of carrying the hill, Colonel Crichton, commanding the brigade, ordered us to fall back to the foot of the hill, which we did, carrying as many of the wounded with us as possible. On reaching the foot of the hill, finding that I was the only officer of the regiment not disabled, I took command. 
rallied the men and rejoined the brigade. Soon after reaching the foot of the hill, Colonel Crichton received his mortal wound and soon after died from its effects. The number of enlisted men who were in line at the commencement of the battle was 206, of whom 13 were killed, 48 wounded, none missing. Most of the wounds were severe ones. The men all behaved admirably and would not fall back until ordered. And the unparalleled losses of officers testifies to their bravery and devotion. In the death of Colonel Crichton and Lieutenant Colonel Crane, our losses are reparable. They need know from us we cannot do their memory nor feelings justice but we will always hold them in remembrance for their efforts on our behalf and as our guides through a dozen battles. We will now make our way to the top of White Oak Mountain to look down into the ravine where we will finish our program. The park ranger now stands forward facing on the slope of a ridge in a wooded area. The ranger stands in amongst a green leafy patch of kudzu. Behind the ranger, down in the valley, are trees and structures scattered about. Come to you now from the top of White Oak Mountain, just to the right of the ravine that Crichton's brigade attacked up. The seventh suffered greatly, but they were not alone. The rest of the brigade also withered under the heavy fire. Nearby, just to the right of the 7th Ohio, the 28th Pennsylvania also suffered. 23-year-old printer turned soldier, Sergeant Ambrose Henry Hayward, pictured here in early 1864 in private purchase sack coat, sporting sergeant stripes and a veteran service stripe. And his friend, 25-year-old Corporal Henry Fivian, pictured here in Union uniform, whom Hayward considered an old standby, honest as the day is long, once again fought beside each other. Hayward later wrote of the personal trauma he endured there. We rushed with a yell up the mountain. On we went, fearless of death, until the men sank down exhausted. We opened upon the rebels with a fearful volley which seemed to cause them to waver, for we could see their officers spring up and wave their swords as if trying to rally the men. We raise up to renew the charge, a cheer running along our lines. We did advance, but only to meet death more certain. Many a good fellow in the first brigade had fallen, not to lay where he fell, but wounded and dead, rolled together down the steep rocky soil of the mountain. I saw, saw poor Fivian when he was struck. He had just spoke to me about his gun. It would not go off. The ball struck him in the side. He dropped his rifle. I saw that I could not reach him. I turned away dreading to see him roll down the mountain. I could, not, I could tell you more such tales, but it is unpleasant for me to bring them back to my memories as it is for you to read them. How unequal the conflict. We could scarcely see the enemy who were concealed while we were exposed to the murderous fire. The seventh Ohio next on our left began to fall back. I knew we must go soon, for we could not keep up our feeble fire against the enemy. I remember the feeling of dread when we were ordered to fall back, slowly, for I knew they would rise up and pour the bullets into us. Down we went, half sliding, catching the trees, and holding on to the bushes, frequently passing men wounded or dead that had lodged against the rocks or trees. We reformed again near the spot where we advanced from. The rolls were called and many who were present in the morning never would answer again. For the 7th Ohio, the regiment had lost more than they had lost at Gettysburg. They lost 12 of the 13 officers they had gone into the battle with. A staggering loss that they would never recover from. The spirit of the roosters was broken forever, though they would 
fight in a few more battles. They never again uttered the battle, their distinct battle cry again and refused to re-enlist in 1864, going home that May. The battles of Colonel Crichton and Crane were sent back home to Cleveland, Ohio, where they were lauded as heroes and buried in a huge ceremony, side by side, picture of Crichton and Crane's tombstones in Cleveland, Ohio. Henry Fivian had no elaborate ceremony though. Maybe a few words were spoken over his grave. Maybe Hayward was in attendance as he was buried in the Chattanooga National Cemetery. Picture of Henry Fivian's tombstone in Chattanooga National Cemetery. But like Crane, he would not rest for alone. In June of 1864, Henry Hayward was also buried there, having been mortally wounded in a skirmish near Pine Mountain, Georgia. Picture of Henry Hayward's grave in Chattanooga National Cemetery. The Battle of Ringgold, though small, had dire consequences for those who fought there and was felt by many, just as fights like Gettysburg and Antietam had. Many hearts were broken by what occurred here on the slopes of White Oak Mountain. We'd like to thank you all for watching this video here in our commemoration of the 157th anniversary of the struggle for Chattanooga.